Is this the end of the world? Uh, if you were with us last week, you'll remember that Revelation is in fact not the end. Uh, we need to remember how to read the book of Revelation. This is uh, my favorite series. I love this book. The more that I study it and the more preparation I do, the more that I want to take like 20 weeks on this thing. I know you guys don't want to take 20 weeks on this thing. Uh, maybe you do. If you do, let me know because I'd be more than happy to spend 20 weeks breaking down every single verse in line because there's just so much in here that's so good. Um, the hardest part of this message for me was like deciding which parts to not talk about because there's so much good stuff to talk about in the book of Revelation. If you have your Bible, you can turn to Revelation chapter 13. We're going to be reading verse 16 through 18 eventually. Uh, but before we get there, we'll kind of build up and give some background information. So last week, we got kind of an introduction and an overview of the book of Revelation. Learn how to read it. We remember that Revelation is an apocalypse. So that means it is showing us how the world really works. Although we think the world may work one way, uh, the world does not always work the way we think it's working. It's, what we think is happening isn't what always is happening. Uh, we use the analogy of the Wizard of Oz. Uh, the Wizard of Oz appears great and powerful. He looks like this great green floating head. And then you get an apocalypse as the curtain is pulled back and it's just an old man behind the curtain pulling the lovers. And that is the origin of the phrase, the man behind the curtain. If you've ever wondered where that phrase came from, it's from the Wizard of Oz. Uh, so that is how we read this book. It is helping us understand what is going on in our world. We also learned the book of Revelation is prophecy. Prophecy, which is speaking for God. When we hear the word prophecy, we aren't only thinking of foretelling the future or, or getting a glimpse of what's going to happen at the end of the world, but it's also God giving an explanation of what is happening in our world today and uh, understanding that more clearly. And so when we read the words in Revelation, we are not just reading a prediction of the future. We aren't just reading, here's how the world's going to end one day, but we are getting an understanding from God. Here's how we should look at the events of our world today. We began by unpacking that last week, remembering that God is on the throne of the world. And for all of time in history, that has been the case. God has been in control. God has been ruling. And now tonight we are going to look at what I'm sure you were all dying to know as soon as you heard the book of Revelation, the mark of the beast. You guys excited? Yes. Like, okay, who here just thinks they know, who's heard of the Mark of the Beast before? Let's start with that. Pretty much everyone. Couple of you, have you, you've never heard of the Mark of the Beast? Interesting. This will be fun for you. You'll probably have an easier time than anyone else because for a lot of us, we, we are kind of shaped by our culture, we're shaped by our world. And so when we hear Mark of the Beast, there's a number of different things that trigger inside our heads and inside our minds. Some of us, it like freaks us out a little bit. He, he was saying, you're going to burst my bubble. I'm not really comfortable <laughs> talking about the Mark of the Beast. Is anyone in here like uncomfortable? They saw the number 666 on the note sheets and they're like, um, this is church. Why do we have the devil's number on here? I, I, I put a video on Instagram. I don't know if anyone saw it <laughs> earlier today with the, uh, um, the Iron Maiden song, Six. Six, six, the number of the beast, which is just great because, gosh, I'm just going to burst the bubble right now. Six, six, six is not the devil's number. So like if you thought it was, if that's what you're expecting, it's just not. It's not. So yeah, we'll just start. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so you're like, I, I, I've gone to church my whole life and I just found this out. And uh, so I'm excited for you because you won't deal with all the baggage that the rest of us are dealing with as we jump into this because you don't have all these misconceptions. Uh, we read the Bible with a lot of misconceptions. We kind of import things in and we add things on and we're shaped by our world and our culture, but we need to be shaped by the culture of the Bible and the world of the Bible, the context of the Bible, not by the context of our world. And so we, need to, we just need to take off some of our kind of misunderstandings of the Bible in order to understand what it is saying and how it is teaching us. So, We'll just, I, we'll just start right there. It's not the devil's number. So you just got to take that out of your mind, jettison that from your head. It's not an evil number. It's not the devil's number. It does mean something. We're going to talk about that. And so let, we'll, we'll start here uh, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. Uh, John begins the book by saying this is a revelation of Jesus Christ. Dominic, if you can stick that up on the screen. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show his servants the things that must be soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John. So this is John's beginning of this letter. This is a letter to churches. So it's not just a book about the end. It's a letter written to someone. 
So when someone sends you a letter, you're going to assume that letter has something to do with you, right? So I got a Christmas card from my friend David. I've known him my whole life, and there's a letter in there. And if I read you that Christmas card, it's not going to make a lot of sense to you other than the fact that you'll know it's about Christmas. But like he'll make some personal references, and it'll be like, okay, what does this have to do with me? And if you tried to read that Christmas card as a like prediction for your life, it'd go poorly because the letter wasn't written to you. It's written to me. So if you're going to understand my Christmas card, you need to understand my relationship with David. You need to understand kind of what, what my life has been like and where I've been and what's going on. Same thing when we read this book, we need to remember it's written to a certain people. So John begins by saying, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. So who is revelation about? Let's try that again. John says it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. So who's revelation about? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. So... It's a revelation of Jesus Christ, not a revelation of Satan. So when we read this book, we're assuming this book is going to tell us things about Jesus, not that it's going to tell us things about Satan. So you can, that's your first fill in the blank. Revelation is about Jesus. And that is fundamental for understanding this book, is that this is not a book about Satan. It's not a book about evil. It's not a book about destruction. It's a book about Jesus and what he's doing in his world. It's a prophetic book. It's not just predicting the future, it's explaining the present. So, let's talk about the mark. Mark and pulp culture. Uh, we, we hear of it all the time as the devil's number, and I'm consistently surprised by non-Christians, uh, people who claim to be atheists, people who claim to not know Jesus, and yet they're still uncomfortable with this number. And to me, that just feels like a little bit of, um, like, there's just... We're, we're not meeting, because if you don't believe in God, there's no reason for you to be freaked out by a number that shows up in his book, and so I don't know why our world is so freaked out by this, but it's just kind of a, a pop culture thing, some cognitive dissonance going on, but uh, this is a common understanding in our culture. It's the devil's number. Another common thing I've heard is it's the Antichrist's number, and uh, we don't even have time to open the can of worms about who the Antichrist is. Uh, we will get to that on After the Fact. Uh, this week. We'll talk about that on After Effect this week. Who is the Antichrist? What's that about? If you're not following us on Instagram, you're missing out on all the After the Facts. It's popping. It's good stuff. If you don't have an Instagram, this stuff is all posted to YouTube. And so you can watch it on the MC of the Church YouTube. There's a whole playlist of trademark stuff, and you can see everything that's been posted for trademark. I'm looking at you because you're the one who's always poking at me. I think everyone else in here has Instagram besides like you and you. So like it's on YouTube. If you want to watch it there, you can. We'll talk about the Antichrist. We don't have time to dig into that. But, um, so, so here's, as I was studying some stuff and, and reading some things in preparation for this message, I watched a few YouTube videos, and that's always a bad idea, watching YouTube videos about the mark of the beast and the Antichrist. It's never going to go well. But, Ari heard me. I was laughing in my office so hard because people have such wacky ideas about what this thing is. So this is from a Christian video made about the mark of the beast. These are Christians. Warning, in this day and age, the mark of the beast will come in the form of a barcode or computer chip that will go into the right hand of the forehead. <laughs> I mean, no, that's not true. It's not at all what this is about. And if we read the text with any respect for what it's saying, with any respect for the original audience, with any respect for John, with any respect for Jesus, who's speaking these words we would come away with a very different understanding of what this is. This is no more than just pop culture, like, fear-mongering. And so, like, if you're freaked out about getting a coronavirus vaccine because you're convinced that's the mark of the beast, if you're freaked about a chip in your credit card or your phone because you're convinced that's the mark of the beast, that's not, don't worry. Like, let me just ease your fears. There's no microchip, there's no barcode, there's no nothing that's going to, like, end your life and make you go to hell on accident. No one goes to hell on accident. I don't have time to open that one either. But uh, another way I've heard the Mark of the Beast talked about, an evil number. So there's this whole deal, and I don't know if y'all heard about it, there's this whole deal with like monster energy drinks and why they're evil because there's like 666s six, six, on the can and all kinds of stuff. And that's another just wonderful Christian pop culture thing that like Christians just, just get wacky about some stuff. And it comes because we read this book poorly. We read this book and we assume that it's something it's not. We assume that it's saying something that it isn't. We distort its message, and so then we distort all kinds of things in our world, and we get freaked out about things that we have no business getting freaked out about. Most people scared about the number 666. 
Most people scared about the mark of the beast have not even read Revelation. They couldn't tell you where this thing's found. They couldn't tell you what's it, what it's about. All they can tell you is that this is a really bad thing that I should avoid. So, if we're going to talk about this thing, let's actually read the Bible. Like, this is a concept. Let's actually read the thing and study it and see what we can figure out. So, Revelation chapter 13, verse 16 through 18. Everyone's favorite part of the Bible. I know you're just jumping on this. Also, this is the word of God. Also, it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead, so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark. That is, the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Here's what the Bible has to say about this mark. So we can't possibly understand these two verses if we don't understand the context of this whole passage. Revelation is this dense letter. There's a lot going on. Paul, or John is making a, a, a lot of arguments and he's, he's telling a story and this comes at the end of the story. And so if we're going to understand imagery at the end of the story, we need to read the story. We need to understand what's going on. This would be like going to Harry Potter number seven, opening up and hearing about a horcrux and freaking out about a horcrux, but you have no idea what a horcrux is because you never read Harry Potter. And all the Christians with strict parents said, amen, that's amen. me. Amen. Like, we, I never read Harry Potter, and so people talked about horcruxes and how scary they were, and I was like, what's a horcrux? People talked about Voldemort and why you shouldn't say his name, and I was like, why Voldemort? Why is he scary? I don't know. But then when you read the books, and I'm not advocating for you to read or to not read the books, I'm just saying, if you read the books, then you understand, oh, here's what this thing means, here's what this name means. It's the same thing with this. We're opening in the middle of a story, and we're not going to understand these symbols unless we know the whole story. So when we read the Bible, we need to read it literally, not literally. Literately, not literally. So we read it like literature. We read it assuming there's symbolism, that there's important things going on, and we don't read it necessarily at face value. A lot of this stuff is poetry. And if you read poetry at face value, you come up with some weird stuff. Shakespeare writes all the time about his wife, and he says, your eyes are our sun. Your eyes are like the sun. And if I read that literally, I'm going to believe there's a ball of flaming gas in his wife's eyes. And that's not what it says. If you read it literally, that's what it says. But if you read it literately, if you read it like poetry, if you understand the context of that poem, you understand, oh, he's not saying his wife's eyes are big, giant balls of gas. He's saying that his wife's eyes are blazing and fun to look at. And I don't know, depending on how you feel about the sun, maybe you have a really bad relationship with the sun. And, and it's like, I don't know, maybe, her, maybe she's really ugly and her eyes like make you go blind. I don't know. <laughs> or it's like, wow, your eyes give me light and they give me life and they fill me with happiness and joy just like the sun on a nice spring day. I wouldn't say summer day because we're in California and the sun on a summer day is no good. Um, so we need to read the Bible literally or literately, literally. We need to read it like good literature. We need to put this text into its context. We need to read the symbols here. So John has given an overview of divine history uh, from Revelation chapter 12 through 14. He's going to do it from another angle. And so this is a sequence of visions at the center of this book. It's understanding the world and all of its events from different angles. And so if you start in chapter 12, and we're not going to read the whole thing, but I just want to give you an overview because we need this overview in order to understand these symbols and signs. If you start in chapter 12, John is giving a prophetic, not predictive, but prophetic as in like interpreting, a prophetic vision of world history. He, and so he starts with a woman clothed in the sun with the moon under her feet and, and, and a dragon who she's fighting with. And like, this is a really epic battle. So you can read this for yourself. Revelation chapter 12, it's a fun chapter. A woman and a dragon battling it out. Well, what does that mean? Was there literally a woman and literally a dragon fighting? No, it's prophetic language. It's symbolism for what's going on in world history. The, this woman represents God and his people, represents Israel. And you get this because you read the Bible. You read other parts. If you look, this is a really thick book. Revelation comes at the end, and so we begin at the beginning of the story, and if you start in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 to be exact, you start there, and we start this story of 
And what do you hear? You hear of a dragon, a serpent. These are the same words for a Hebrew mind. Freaks us out and complicates us as English people because we hear serpent, we hear dragon, we think of them as very separate. For a Hebrew speaker, this is the same thing. Dragon, serpent, it's all the same word for them. The Bible, the story of the Bible starts with a serpent in a garden fighting with a woman. Right? So this is the start of biblical history. And then for the rest of this thing, all of the offspring of the woman, the rest of humanity, and all of the offspring of the serpent, all the powers of evil, are fighting. They're, they're in a battle for control of the world. And so that's just what John is giving us. From, from the beginning of the garden, climaxing on the cross where Jesus gets victory, ending with the city of God, Revelation 12 is giving us this divine cosmic overview. Here's the story of the world. Here's the story of history. Revelation chapter 13, you turn the page, and it's the same story. He again goes back to the very beginning, but now he tells it from a different angle. It's like a diamond. We, we, we put a diamond under the light, and if you look at it from one, one direction, it's really pretty. Then you turn it a little bit, you get the light to strike a little bit differently. It's, oh, this looks like a whole new diamond. I see it all differently. This is what John's doing. So he gives us this story from one perspective. Then the next chapter, he tells the story again from a different perspective. This time, he tells it as a battle between the political and economic systems of the world and those of God and his kingdom. This is another story woven into the Bible more subtly. And so here's what he does in verse 1 through 10. He says, there's a beast rising out of the sea with 10 horns, 7 heads, 10 diadems on its horn, blasphemous names on its heads. And you can read this whole thing. And it's this really cool, like, this was my dream when I was in middle school. Like, I'd love to just read this book and like, whoa, this is cool. There's beasts and dragons and heads and serpents and lizards. And it's everything that, that I ever wanted what this is doing. This is linking us back to Daniel chapter 7. I'm telling you, this book is smart. This book is great. This is giving us the same image from Daniel chapter 7. It's pulling it back. Daniel sees this vision of a beast. John is referencing that vision to help describe and understand the world. I see your eyes kind of glazing over a little bit. We're getting there. We're getting there. But we need to understand these images and symbols in order to figure out what even does this thing mean? What is this mark? What is this number? John gives these two different beasts one of these beasts represents all the empires that have ever ruled in the world. That's this first beast. Saying there's all these empires, there's all these, and so the imagery here is crowns, heads, authority. It's all these pictures of people ruling, empires reigning, all these pictures of, of, of ruling and reigning in the world, calling back to Daniel 7. Then, this second beast, verse 11 through 18, he says, I see a second beast rising up out of the earth, has two horns like a lamb, speaks like a dragon, and again, just gives all this rich imagery. And this is a prophetic description of the Roman imperial cult, that in John's day and age, the empire of Rome is viewed as this like divine thing. It is like a god itself. In fact, the Roman emperor it, it is called the Lord and Savior of the world. Does that phrase, Lord and Savior, sound familiar to anyone? Yeah, many of you have been asked, is Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life? Like these are religious, spiritual terms, and those terms aren't an accident. The fact that the Bible uses the words Lord and Savior to describe Jesus isn't accidental. It's not just the Bible being religious, but it's the Bible directly confronting the culture and the nation that's in power in its day and age. In the time of Jesus, the emperor of Rome is called the Lord and Savior of the world. And so Jesus says, I am the Lord and Savior of the world. Jesus declares that his power is greater than the power of Rome. His power is greater than all the powers of the world. The Roman Empire, in its day and age, is viewed as the divine body of the emperor, and you owe your allegiance to the empire. Again, this sounds familiar to us as Christians because we hear about Jesus, our Lord and Savior, and his body, the church. Jesus is directly combating, directly countering the arguments of Rome. The emperor says, I'm Lord and Savior of the world. The Roman Empire is my body. You owe allegiance to it. And so Jesus says, I'm the Lord and Savior of the world. The church is my body, and you owe your allegiance to me first and foremost. The problem is, John can't say any of these things directly. Remember, John is writing to a persecuted church. The people reading this letter are experiencing massive persecution. They're getting their heads chopped off for the message of Jesus. They're getting thrown in prison for the message of Jesus. Their, their families are getting torn apart and thrown into cages for the message of Jesus. John wants to encourage them to say, hey, I know it looks like Rome is winning, but Rome is not in control of the world. The emperor is not the Lord and Savior of the world. Jesus is. The problem is if he writes that down, what's Rome going to do to him? He's going to suffer the same fate as everyone else. He's going to get his head chopped off. 
He's going to be thrown in prison. And in fact, that's what has happened. He's writing this letter in exile from the island of Patmos because he's pissed off the Roman government. And so they've exiled him. They've sent him away because they're tired of him spreading the message of Jesus. Next step is he's going to get his head chopped off if he's not careful. And so he needs to write these things down and say them in a way that his readers and his audience are going to understand and not get him in trouble for it. So he uses biblical and political references to say all these things without actually saying them. Kind of like a political cartoon. Dominic, there's a picture in there of a political cartoon. If you can stick that up on the screen. A donkey and an elephant fighting over a deficit. Uh, this is a political tomb, cartoon, by the way, from 2006. Has nothing to do with today's politics. Trying to make a position. This stuff happened before some of you guys were born. And that's literally not a joke, which is wild to me because I was in fourth grade in 2006. And so this trips me out that some of you guys weren't even alive. But when we watch this cartoon, are we assuming that there is a talking elephant and a talking donkey and they're fighting with each other? No, okay. No, what is this? We see the elephant and it represents, does anyone know what the elephant represents? Republicans. Does anyone know what the donkey represents? Democrats. <laughs> okay, so this is images. It's images of quote unquote beasts. One image represents a political party. One beast represents another political party. John is doing the same exact thing here. This is an ancient political cartoon. He's giving this picture of a beast and he's using all these images that his readers are familiar with. And so when they hear the, ten be the, the beast with ten horns and seven heads, they think, oh, duh, Rome. Rome has seven mountains and it has ten different governors. Oh, of course, that must be the empire of Rome. Like this, to us, this is like, whoa, what do you think the ten horns represent? What do you think the, ten, the, the seven heads represent? But to an original reader, it's like, oh, of course, you're talking about Rome. In the next chapter, or in the next section, when he talks about th th this beast who has a head wound and comes back to life, like for us, that's like, whoa, will that be the Antichrist? For a reader of this day and age, they know exactly what this means. Nero had died from a head wound, and there were lots of reports that he was not actually dead, but was going to come back and rule and reign. And so the emperors who succeeded after Nero called themselves literally Nero reborn. And so for someone reading about this second beast, they're like, oh, duh, of course, this is Nero reborn. That's exactly what this is about. This makes perfect sense. Christianity is illegal. Rome is in power. And so John has to say all this through a political cartoon. So are you ready? The mark of the beast. What is the mark? <clears throat> Man, should I tell you now or should I like build to it and then tell us, now. tell us, tell you now? Okay, the mark of the beast is Rome. The mark of the beast is the Roman Empire. Lest you think I just pulled that out of my butt, here, here's the argument and we're going to support this from the Bible, right? I'm not just making this up. This is what the Bible is telling us. So, verse 16. John says, also it, it being this beast, causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark. That is, the name of the beast or the number of its name. So this word mark, this word mark is a Greek word. This word is kerygma, kerygma. Sorry, kerygma. I read it wrong. Not that you guys really care. The Bible nerd in me cares, and so you just have to bear with my Bible nerdness. The Greek word is karagma, and this is a word used for coins. What this word means is every single coin, and in fact, our coins, does anyone have a coin in here? Does anyone have a coin in their pocket? A penny, quarter, nickel, dime? If you have one, you'll look at that coin, and what does it have on it? It has a head. It has the head of a president. It has the face of a president. That is a karagma. That is a mark. That's exactly what this word is talking about. When it says there's a mark on the right hand of the forehead, it's saying there's a karagma, a presidential head, the, the face of an emperor. And so on every single coin, there's a mark of the emperor. And that mark says, and in this case, it says Caesar Nero, Nero Caesar, Lord and Savior of the world. That's literally what their coin says. And so when they see this word karagma, they think, oh, of course, a Roman coin. And what does it say? If you don't have this mark, you cannot buy or sell throughout the whole world. Imagine trying to live in ancient Rome. They don't have Apple Pay. They don't have Google Wallet. You don't have a credit card. The only way for you to buy something is to use Roman money. 
And if you don't have Roman money, you're straight out of luck. So if you don't have this coin with the image of the emperor on it, you cannot buy or sell in the whole land. And so these people hear this and like, oh, of course, a mark that allows me to buy or sell. And if I don't have this, I can't buy or sell. What could that possibly be? Oh, of course, the karagma, the mark on this coin, the mark of Caesar's head. Rome controls the money supply. Without the money, it's impossible to do business. So that, that's what this is. And, th and then, it, as if to, to hammer this point home further, that this thing represents Rome and its authority, says it's a mark that goes on the hand or the forehead, a mark on the right hand or the forehead. Now we hear this and it's like, oh, what could this be? Maybe it's a microchip. They'll put it on your right hand, they'll put it on your forehead. And then like, that's where it's going to be. And then you can't buy or sell without the microchip. Was this letter written to me in the age of microchips? No. Who is this letter written to? It's written to people in the ancient Roman Empire. Do they have a microchip? Does this letter mean something to them? Yes. John writes this letter because he wants to actually tell them something. I just get really frustrated with people sometimes because it's like, what are you reading? How are you interpreting this thing? This book is written to Roman citizens and John expects them to understand these words. And so, for Roman Christians, they're very familiar with a common Jewish cultural practice. You might know of this practice, actually. Uh, the, the word is, and let me see if I can pronounce it right, uh, teflon. Are you familiar with the teflon? Yes. Okay, so a teflon. Ancient Jews in the ancient Near East, they would take the Shema, which is a prayer from Deuteronomy 6. Hear, hear, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Shema Yisrael, Elohim Adonai, Elohim Echad. This is a prayer reminding them of allegiance to their Lord, their God, Yahweh, the God of the Bible. It's reminding them of my allegiance to him first and foremost. They'd take this thing and they'd write it down on a little scroll and then they'd put it on their right hand, strapped in a little box. They put it in a box strapped on their forehead as a reminder that everything I think and everything I do, everything I do with my hands, everything I think with my head is all done in devotion to my Lord and Savior, to my God Yahweh. This Shema, this prayer, this mark, it, I'm literally marked. Everywhere I go, you can look at my hand and you know I am a follower of Yahweh. You look at my forehead and you see that Teflon. You see that box with that scripture and you see, oh, that's a person whose allegiance is given to Yahweh because on their forehead, on their hand is marked, Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And so they're, they're marked from everyone in society. You can look and easily see, oh, you're a Jew, you're a Jew, you're a Jew, you're not. Like, it's really obvious. And so, for someone reading this letter, as an ancient Christian, they hear a mark on the right hand, a mark on the forehead, and their mind immediately goes, oh, duh, of course, a Teflon. That makes sense. A mark that shows where your allegiance lies. So what John is saying here, John is saying here that there is a call, and, and there's... There's something going on in this world, in this culture, in, in, in the day of Rome, that's asking you to give your allegiance to Rome. To give your allegiance to its economic systems by using its mark, its coinage, and to give your allegiance to its political power systems, taking the mark on your hand, on your forehead. Instead of your allegiance being to God and his word, your allegiance is to Rome and the empire. And this is what Rome is asking everyone to do. And this is what's directly happening in, in this day and age of this church is if you don't swear allegiance to Rome, if you don't bow down and worship a statue of the emperor, you go to jail and you go to prison. You need to declare your allegiance to your Lord and Savior, Emperor Nero. And if you don't, off with your head. So John is saying, hey, don't take this mark. Instead, stay allegiant to Jesus. Keep your allegiance to the Lord our God. The Lord is one. And everything you think and everything you do, let your actions, let your life be devoted to God and to God alone. So that is the mark of the beast. Rome, the number of the beast, 666, another fun one. Does anyone have any guess for what 666 means? Any thoughts? I'm going to throw something out. What? Means the devil. Any other thoughts? All right. Yeah, you have a thought? Three nines upside down. It's an age. It's an age. Ooh, that, that, no. Um, okay, here's what it is. Here's what it is. So let's start with what does the Bible say about this number? Anytime we're going to read the Bible, we should start by letting the Bible interpret the Bible. What a novel thought. 
And yet, 99% of Christian videos on YouTube, and I don't, those of you watching right now on YouTube, I don't know if it's actually 99%. I didn't watch them all. But a vast majority of videos by Christians trying to explain the Bible, they see the number 666 and they immediately jump to conspiracy theories. They immediately jump to their own crackpot ideas. They immediately jump to non-Christian people interpreting the Bible. And I would just plead with you, if you're going to interpret the Bible, start by letting the Bible interpret the Bible. So, sorry, I just, I get really worked up about these things sometimes. So if we look for the number 666, we see where else does this number show up in the Bible? It does show up in the Bible. This book, this number shows up in Chronicles, and I didn't grab the actual reference. I should have, but I didn't. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll Google it right now. I have Wi-Fi in here, and I will get that to you by the end of the, uh, um, it's actually going to take me two seconds as long as the Wi-Fi holds up. Okay, 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 14. Or 2 Chronicles chapter 9, verse 13. You don't need to put that on the screen, but you can read that later if you're interested. All right, all right did you just look it up? Oh, you're almost there. 1 Kings chapter 10, I'll use the 2 Chronicles one. 2 Chronicles 9, 13. This is a description of Solomon, king of Israel, son of David, you hear that term, son of David, that should remind you of another important biblical figure. This is a term also used to talk about Jesus. Solomon, the son of David, is the king on the throne. And God gives three rules to kings of Israel. He tells them, you should not, let me get my notes so I say the right thing, you should not build up a large army, you should not form foreign alliances, you should not amass a stockpile of wealth. These are the three rules given to kings in Israel. And what does Solomon do? If you read his story, he builds a large army. He amasses foreign, he, he makes foreign alliances. He amasses wealth. And so, 2 Chronicles gives us this description of Solomon's life. It tells us everything he did. And it tells us about the large army that he created. It tells us about all the foreign alliances that he formed. And then it finishes by telling us about all the great wealth that he builds up. And it says... The wealth of Solomon weighs 666 talents of gold. So this is, the, this is the number about Solomon. And what's this saying about Solomon? Well, it's saying Solomon disobeyed the law of the kings. He, he disobeyed the law that God gave. And he used his power. He, he used his position. He used his prestige not to serve other people, but to serve himself. He is a ruler with unbridled power. He uses it to oppress and hurt other people. If you read the story of Solomon, you'll see that he builds all this wealth. He builds his empire off the backs of slave labor. He, he builds it off the back of, uh, uh, of economic oppression of his people and of foreign people, of immigrants within his land. And these are all things that God's law says you shouldn't do. Solomon breaks all of these laws. He does all the things he shouldn't do. He amasses all this wealth. He's a ruler with unbridled power. So, the Bible says the number 666. What does it represent? It represents a ruler with unbridled power. But John also says, and you can read it there in verse 18, he says, let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. Now this word calculate, this is not a common word in scripture. This, this, is a, this really is kind of a math technical term. You should calculate the number. And so, here, here's, here's the term I'm going to throw at you. The term is gematria. Gematria, and this is a process common in the ancient world where different letters have different number values. And if you add up all the different values of each letter in the word, you come up with a number. This is weird to us because we don't do this today. It's really common in the ancient world. And so like it's similar. My name would be, well, A is the first letter of the alphabet. D is the fourth letter of the alphabet. A is the first, so that's six. And then M is like the 16th letter of the alphabet or something like that. And so six plus 16 is 22, 22. And so the value of my name would be 22 in the system of gematria. In the value of Hebrew letters, for this day and age, if you take the title Nero Caesar, Caesar Nero, which is his common title within the world, you get the letters N-R-O-N-Q-S-R, -N -N obviously 
in Hebrew, not in English. And if you add up all those numerical values, 50 plus 200 plus 6 plus 50 plus 100 plus 60 plus 200, you get the number 666. So the number 666, it says it is the number of a man. I'm just, I'm reading the text to you right here. This is the number of a man. It's a number of a person. This person is Nero. 666 is about Nero. It's not about the devil. It's not about the end times. It's not about the Antichrist. It is about Nero. This is a reference to a ruler with unbridled power. And, and, and how, how do I know this for sure? If you look at your Bible, you'll see after that, after that number 666, you'll see the number 8. If you have a trademark Bible, it's going to be the number 8. I don't know what it is. If you have a non-trademark Bible, you'll see a little footnote. And if you follow that footnote down to the bottom of the page, it's going to tell you some manuscripts say 616. Now, what does that mean? The, the Bible isn't written in English. We all know this. It's written in ancient Greek, and it's translated into English a number of different times. And there's tons of different manuscripts. The Bible is translated into tons of different languages. And when the Bible is translated into Latin, that's the language of Rome, the Bible translators change that number 666 to the number 616 because the word Nero Caesar, Caesar Nero, has different numerical values under this gematria system. And in Latin, the values of the word Caesar Nero is 616. And so Bible translators want you to understand this symbol. They want their Latin audience to understand the symbol. And so they literally change the number in order for them to understand, hey, this is Nero that we're talking about. Maybe you don't care about all this Bible nerd stuff. I think it's super valuable, super helpful for knowing that the Bible is not giving us some secret code for the future. It's not giving us like, let's use the number 666 to figure out when Jesus will come back. This is saying, hey, look for this ruler with unbridled power, this ruler who acts like Solomon, who breaks all of the rules for how kings ought to behave, rules like a tyrant. It's Nero. So the mark of the beast, Rome, the number of the beast, 666, the number of a man, that man is Nero. So here's what this all means. Here's, I'm, I'm going to conclude with this. Nations become beasts when they exalt their own power and economic security as a false god and then demand total allegiance. I'll say that again. Nations become beasts when they exalt their own power and economic security as a false god and then demand total allegiance. This is what Rome was doing then. This is what still happens today. This is true for any nation at any time. It's a pattern set up in the Bible that repeats over and over again. And so John warns his readers not to participate in the worship of the empire, the worship of the emperor, or the worship of the economy. So what do we do with this today? We'll finish with this real quick, last few blanks and get you out of here. What do we do with this today? Well, we need to reject the idol of emperor. We need to reject idols of emperor. John is reminding his people, don't take this mark, because if you take this mark, you're going to be aligning yourself with this worship of an empire, emperor, and you need, we, we still need to reject the idols of emperor. We still today look to individuals as the Lord and Savior of the world. And this is no more true than in 2020 political systems, where we look to a political candidate as a Lord and Savior of the world. And if you paid attention, even an inkling to the 2020 elections and how people talked about them, it was, if you don't elect so-and-so... The world is screwed. And if you do elect so-and-so, the world is screwed. You can't win either way. I think the only way to win was to just not vote. But that's, if, if you follow their arguments. I'm not against voting. Vote. Never mind. So we need to reject the idols of emperor. We are tempted to put all of our hope and all of our trust into a political figure, into a person to save our world. And regardless of what you think, no individual is going to save our nation no individual is going to save our economy. No individual is going to save our country. No individual is going to save our lives besides Jesus. We need to reject this idol of emperor. And maybe you're hearing like, yeah, I don't care about politics. Screw politics. Yeah, celebrities aren't going to save you either. So Justin Bieber isn't going to fix your world. Kanye West isn't going to fix your world. Like you can pick any individual, your mom or your dad ain't going to fix your world. Your boyfriend, your girlfriend ain't going to fix your world. We consistently, as humans, try to put our trust into individuals. And John is telling us we need to reject the idol of emperor. The emperor is not where we find our hope, not where we find our peace. Second idol we need to reject. We need to reject the idol of empire. The idol of empire. In John's day and age, they're told again and again, Rome is supreme, 
Rome rules the world. Rome demands and deserves your full and total allegiance. You need to bow down to this statue of the emperor, and he represents all of Rome. Rome is this divine body, and you need to give all of it to Rome. And today, we still have our, we still have elements of our world asking for our total allegiance. And we don't give our allegiance to any empire, any kingdom, but the kingdom of God. So our allegiance is not to a country. Our allegiance is not to a culture. Our allegiance is not to a racial identity. Our allegiance is with King Jesus and his kingdom and nothing else. Nothing else. So there, there's nothing wrong with loving your country. I'm not against patriotism. There, there, there's nothing against thinking highly of your nation. There's nothing against wanting your nation to be great and, and wanting it to be a, a, an exceptionally great nation. Like I'm not going to quote any politician here, but there's nothing wrong with wanting America to be great. That's not a sin. That's not evil. That's okay. It's okay to love your nation. It's okay to love your I'm not against any of that. But it's a huge problem when we begin to worship our nation. When we begin to make our culture so important, our country so important, our cultural identity so important that we cannot fathom it looking any different than it looks today. We, we, we cannot fathom any other nation being great. We cannot fathom any other culture being acceptable but our own culture. That is where we veer in to the idolatry of empire. And John says we need to stay away from that because the only kingdom that gets anywhere in the end of the world is the kingdom of Jesus. So our allegiance is with King Jesus and his kingdom, not our emperors of today, not our empires of today. And by the way, this is the same thing when we try to just follow along with the spirit of the age. We, we just live our lives for whatever our culture says is right. That's where we throw our boat in. This is, again, the idolatry of empire, throwing ourselves within our culture, following just the trends of society, following the trends and the, and the morals of our day and age. These are the idols of empire, and we need to stay away from them. And the last idol we need to stay away from is the idol of economy. The idol of economy. And there, if, if there's any idol, any false like hope for us that wants all of our, it is this, more than anything else. And so if I, if I could get nothing else into your heads, do not sell yourself over to the economy. Do not sell yourself over to making your wallet fat. Do not sell yourself over to getting more zeros on the end of your paycheck. Like, we live in a day and age where everything is defined by how much money is in your bank account. And that is just not how the world of the Bible looks. That's just not what the world of King Jesus looks like. So we need to not sell our souls to the idol of the economy. The, the Roman economy is built on slavery and oppression. The way you get those kerygma, karagma, the way you get that mark it is by participating in this system that leads to oppression, that leads to slavery. And, and so John says you need to seek an end to systems of economic oppression and you need to seek the glory of God's kingdom and not your wallet. So what does this look like for us? If we're going to reject the idol of economy, well, it looks like we're going to give generously. We're just going to give money away because it doesn't belong to us. It belongs to God. And he is our source. He is our strength. We're going to put others ahead of ourselves. We're going to set our financial priorities according to God's principles. Here's your last one in the blank, and we'll end with this. Here's how you don't take the mark of the beast. Here's how you avoid that. Give your allegiance to the Lamb. Give your allegiance to the Lamb. Again and again in this passage, right after this, in, in chapter 14, it's going to tell us about a Lamb over and over, and this Lamb is Jesus. And so John says, if you want to avoid all of this bad stuff, you want to avoid all these problems, don't give your allegiance over to Rome. Don't give your allegiance over to Caesar. Don't give your allegiance over to the economy, to, to the empire, to the emperor. Give your allegiance to the Lamb. Give your allegiance to King Jesus. And, and so this would be my charge and my plea with you, studying this, reading this, putting all this in context. Live a life of allegiance to King Jesus and his kingdom, not to the world and its systems or its rulers. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for how it informs us, how it teaches us. Lord, I pray that we would continue to be students of your word, that we would live under its authority, that as we read it, we, we would read it through its own lenses. We would read it through its own culture, its own day, that we wouldn't interpret it the way that we want to, but we would interpret it the way that, that you have for us to. Lord, Lord, I thank you for these warnings you put in Scripture. The, the, these warnings about the dangers of empire, the dangers of, of throwing our lot in with an emperor. Lord, I pray that we would live under your authority and live for your kingdom. Would that become reality in our hearts? 
Would you do that work in our lives that only you can do and cause us to love you more and to serve you more? In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. It is 8.07. We're a little bit over time, but we got this done. Mark of the beasts, number of the beasts. That was fun. Yeah? yeah? Yeah. I had fun. I don't know if you guys had fun. Anyways, Jesus, Jesus. You, are you are better, better. Than, anything than anything in this world. Love you guys. Have a great night. See some of you tomorrow. See some of you Sunday. See some of you next Wednesday. Thank you.